Welcome. Welcome, everybody, from uh, COP23 in Bonn, Germany. This is the Transport Talk Show. We are at DHL headquarters in Bonn, Germany, as I mentioned. We have a great lineup tonight of guests. Tonight's theme is um, transforming, transforming urban mobility. So uh, this is uh, a fantastic lineup to focus on that. I think this is our seventh ta uh, Transport Talk Show. Um, special thanks to PPMC, the Paris Process for Climate and Mobility, which is an initiative between SLOWCAT and Michelin's Movement On for um, sponsoring this, as again, as well as DHL. Um, before we continue with the talk show, a quick housekeeping rules. Please silence your phones within the audience, and remember that you can, if you're listening to us in the Ethernet, uh, send in questions to hashtag WeAreTransport, hashtag WeAreTransport. Um, so, as I mentioned, tonight's theme, uh, which is critical these days, is on urban mobility. So, uh, many people know that this is a, a huge trend globally. We've gone past the 50% mark for urbanization as of, I think, 2014 or 2015. Up from a third of the world was in urban, um, urban communities from the two, from uh, 1960, and I think the trend is expected to perpetually increase, uh, one and a half to two percent per year, depending on the region, etc. So it's it's a cr it's a critical uh, issue, and uh, transportation, of course, is is key among that. So um, our first we have four great guests. Um, our first guest here is Tanya Vorvik from. Um, the BMZ, which she'll, spell, she'll explain the full title. Then we have Stephanie um, Hallsworth from UN Habitat, and Monica Zimmerman from ICLE, uh, which is a cities group, a cities representative group, and Sebastian von Herck from uh, a new initiative called Global Center of Excellence on Climate Adaptation. Uh, so first we'll spend some time with Tanya, and then uh, we'll, we'll continue over here. So um, Tanya. Uh, BMZ does quite a bit of work, I know, on a lot of different issues, but I think since we're focusing tonight on urban mobility, uh, maybe you can explain, well, first of all, what are you doing here? Who are you? Yeah, and who am I? <laughs> and what are you doing here at COP23? Yeah, so hello from Bonn, from the COP23, our home city. My name is Tanya Vorweg. I'm the Deputy Director General at the Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development. And I'm responsible for many things, but especially for transport and urban issues. Excellent. Okay, so that's the, that's your focus. So it's yeah. good we have you here. And um, I know that uh, your your organization is especially involved in a Transforming Urban Mobility Initiative, also known as TUMI. I don't know if you call it TUMI or TUMI or what, but maybe you can go into that. What What is this initiative in particular? And, and when was it launched? I think yeah, uh, just a so year ago or something. So our ministry is involved with several teams here, the COP, and the ones are the negotiators, so they are working on what is going on there in the, in the negotiation. And the others, we are working on long streams, and this is about our initiative, Transforming Urban Mobility. It's an in initiative we have launched last year in Quito, and Quito was a very special place because after a long run of preparation and several pre-COPs, there have been the final Habitat 3 conference, which takes place every 20 years. It took place last year in Quito. And on this Habitat conference, working on a new urban agenda, the German government and my ministry, we launched the first initiative on transport. So since that time, we gained momentum and we got we had just met uh, some days ago, and we have now 11 partners on board. That, that's great. So the um, 11 partners, so maybe you can explain a little bit before we go into the partners. Um, what exactly is this initiative? So how does it unpack? Yeah, we have thought, well, how to work the best on the issue of urban mobility and how to get as many as possible partners on board. So, and we decided to set up three pillars. The first pillar is about financing urban infrastructure because there's a huge demand on new infrastructure. On the one side, in the cities that are built already, we have to change these cities into sustainable mobility, integrated systems. And on the other hand, we know that there are a huge hundreds, millions of cities which will still be built until 2050. So the growing population needs, needs these cities and we are working on these cities as well. So that means, first of all, financing instruments. We want to uh, set up um, 
a large fund, and we have already done that. So the KFW, our bank, brought to the market one billion in the year 2017, and we will go on to spend one billion a year from the German government for sustainable infrastructure in the cities. The second pillar is, what about the people? They have to run these things. They have to decide and they have to plan this. So the second pil pillar is about capacity development. We, ha we want to, we want to um, well, educate, train 1,000 urban game changers. And this cap capacity development is around the group of urban planners, transport practitioners, and local decision makers, we w because we want to make them fit to make the cities as a front runner. And um, these pillars are so, so important um, because we think only the combination of different action will field will bring this to a really speedy uh, momentum. So what about the, the third pillar? Um, the third pillar is about um, working together with cities. So we have set up a large program where we prepare cities with special needs. For example, we have set up a facility study for Mexico City. It just re recently was ready. It's about the largest, world largest bus, e-bike transit sector through a huge city which is already built. And these are the examples and pilots on a large scale we want to show that there is a change possible. That, that's really great. So, so I'm hearing that there's, you're working on finance, which is very robust through your organization, as well as capacity building of the people involved. And it looks like there's like a thousand people you're aiming to, to work with in the first phase, uh, maybe some pilots in particular, and then directly with the cities. And, and there, are there some pilots that you're, that you're focusing on? Do you know who that might be, which, which cities that might be? Well, it's we okay if you don't write on the spot, but I'm just curious. <laughs> I'm imagining it's like regionally diverse and, and whatnot. Well, um, well I, I feel that what we learned in the um, in this COP now, we just had a had a side event again. We have so many side events at the time for in the on the issue of urban planning and urban mobility. What we have learned about in the last year was that you need to work together with a group of the willing. And the group of the willing especially is about the group of the mayors, the ones who have to make the decision in the city. And that's why we just set up a challenge. So it's a challenge uh, where you com can compete for money, which we want to disperse to 10 pilot projects. We will set up a 1 million, and uh, you can start addressing us and giving us your proposals. And we have, to th we have to see if this is really bold, if this is really innovative, if this is really scalable. So then we can be a, a, a partner in figuring out pilot cases which we can scale up in the next years. Oh, that's excellent. Okay, great. And so um, I actually honestly didn't know that you had really this going on, that's great. And um, uh, regarding the partners that you mentioned, you have 11 partners, and it's, it's great you mentioned you and Habitat, we'll hear more about that from our next guests. <laughs> and cities, the partnering with cities, we'll hear more about that as well. Um, so there's 11 different partners that you're working with. Can you, cities, you and Habitat, et cetera, I imagine. Who, who else are you working with? Who are you not working with? What would you like to see? Yeah, uh, I, I'd say um, thank you to all the partners that joined in the last year. So 11, 11 partners from the cities, from City Network, from UN Habitat, from the developing banks and the World Bank who is running the Secretariat. This is really an amazing thing. But uh, not only because we are here at the DHL headquarter, <laughs> but what we need is to connect with the real world, with the companies the ones who do the innovation. This is a common project which I would like to aim for. So when we could sit here in Bonn uh, one year later now, and we can say where we gained some partners from the private sector like DHL or some companies who build the trains or the cars, because we have a common aim, we have a common goal. I think we are very competent in knowing how the, the countries where we are partnering with, we are partnering with 50 countries all over the country, and we have a knowledge over years how you can be, 
you, you can implement your things in the countries. I think this is our strength, but really bringing innovation like DHL did in the last yeah, years yeah. is really the one, the thing, the, 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 the asset which we can only get from the private sector. And I would like to address the next month the private sector to join in this initiative to give it more, more strength and innovative uh, pollution. That's excellent. And I imagine um, as you're working with certain um, cities in particular where certain industries are quite strong, in particular it'd be very useful to have those particular companies um, involved because they can both be, they, they potentially be the obstructionist if they're not on, on board. So it'd be really great to have those yeah. in particular on board. Um, excellent, thank you so thank much. You. Um, I think before we, um, I'm gonna, we, we all ever ask that one question about what can be done for the transformative sector to transform the sector, but we'll do it all at the end together. Um, thank you so much for that. So if you can hold tight, we'll have questions or conversation at the end. Um, I'm gonna turn now to our other great guests um, who I introduced earlier, but let's start here with you, Stephanie, from UN Habitat. Um, UN Habitat, um, which you referred to, had its uh, uh, big conference in Quito last year. Uh, maybe you can explain a little bit about that in a sec, but first, why are you here at COP23 in Bonn? Yes, um, good evening and also hello to the people that are watching online. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Stephanie Holzwart and I work for the Urban Mobility Unit at UN Habitat. We are headquartered in Nairobi in Kenya. Um, as you have mentioned, uh, UN Habitat has been uh, behind uh, the big conference among many other partners um, in October 2016 um, in Quito, uh, where the outcome document, the new urban agenda, was adopted and released. Um, it's exciting because that document gives us the uh, urban framework for the next uh, 20 years until 2036. And it has been very exciting because it has really brought together a lot of uh, partners from the different sectors, government officials, private sector, we have just heard um, are increasingly an important partner, but also the civil society as much as never before in the previous Habitat conferences. Yes. Absolutely. And so um, oh, let's just go there and we'll hear later on about mm -hmm. what you're doing here. But <laughs> well, what, are, what are you doing here at COP23? Are you... What, what, yes, I mean, uh, at COP23, obviously, um, cities and the urban issue has a, a strong contribution to play to the whole uh, climate discussions. For example, we know that uh, only 2% of the land is allocated by cities, but we are emitting, uh, I think, more than 70% of the greenhouse gas emissions. So cities really play one key role um, towards uh, a better uh, climate future. Um, so a lot of my colleagues from UN Habitat were here attending uh, many events related to urban. I personally have come for some of the transport events uh, since I work on under urban mobility. Excellent. And um, yeah. Yeah, Thanks. excellent. So um, uh, linking the two then, so urban uh, areas clearly such a concentrated space, concentrated emissions, etc. Also, um, one of the, the engines for innovation of solutions as much as as the problems, right? Um, and the ur new urban agenda, it's very much a link to SDG, Sustainable Development uh, Goal 11, but, but lots of links to climate change as well. What is the transportation element of the new urban agenda? Can you, can you speak a little bit to that and, and your work on, on transportation in particular? Yes, so, so um, surely those uh, frameworks of uh, new urban agenda SDGs and um, climate agreements are very much interlinked and mutually uh, reinforcing. We're all looking at the same challenges such as um, air pollution, um, greenhouse gas emissions, but also issues of road safety, um, lacks of accessibility, um, traffic congestion, um, and so on. So I would say that all those um, agendas are somewhat um, contributing to those discussions and trying to set global targets and uh, global goals to, to um, under which um, solutions can be provided f for the future. Yeah. Um, and uh, specifically for the new urban agenda, um, looking at the transport sector, it focuses very much on universal access and access to mobility. So uh, the new urban agenda also has um, one of the goals to be very inclusive and um, 
yeah, especially also looking at um, the vulnerable groups, the urban poor, developing countries, um, and so on. So I would say that really the access to mobility and understanding also mobility um, not as an end, but as a means to, a, to an end, such as accessing urban opportunities, health facilities, work, school, and so on. Um, so understanding uh, mobility um, as, as a means to access further opportunities, I think that's the key essence of, uh, yeah. of the new urban agenda. Absolutely. As we, yeah. you know, many people have said, if you have a wonderfully efficient and safe train, but it goes to nowhere, it's, it's, exactly. it's not, not valuable. Are there, are there great um, uh, examples of, of, your, of you and Habitat's work I mean, you, that, that you can cite in this, in this field, or pilot, or case studies, or initiatives that you're working on with other partners, perhaps, that you'd like to share? Um, yeah, good examples, I mean, good, good practices? Yes. Uh, we have. We are actually finishing end of this year with one project that supported um, the East African capitals, Addis Ababa, Kampala, and Nairobi, on um, upgrading their public transport system. That is hopefully at one point also well integrated with uh, non-motorized transport and, um, and, and ITS and such. Um, what is ITS? Um, intelligent uh, transport system. So Thank we're you. looking at uh, tra transport and traffic management um, that can contribute uh, to better public transport systems. Um, for that project, we have worked together, for example, with um, GIZ for the regional components. So GIZ has facilitated a regional exchange between those three cities. Um, however, that process has also been a little bit challenging because we have been engaged uh, over the last five years, but implementation in form of the construction has not happened yet. Mm. However, we have seen a lot of um, improvements, for example, to the institutional setting. Nairobi has just... Um, um, passed the bill of uh, Ni Nairobi Metropolitan Transport Agency. So we see a lot of um, bits and pieces that are moving the cities into the right direction to at one point have a well-functioning mass rapid transport system, which is essential for uh, yeah, reducing yeah. the traffic conge congestion that we're facing Excellent. in yeah. everyday's life. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, thank you so much. And as we transition from, uh, you know, hi am high ambitions and policy frameworks to implementation on at all scales, at city, national, so, you know, it, it, we're going to, it's, it's a hard road and we're going to find obstacles, but it's through these collaborative efforts and finance and capacity building, et cetera, that we're over going to overcome it. But I'm really glad that you're frank enough to say it's not easy, it's not smooth, uh, that, that you are that there is hard work ahead. So thank you for sharing that very specific example. Um, we'll get back to you with your question about what is one key thing that can happen in the transport sector. Monica from ICLE, um, please share with us first why you're here. Monica Zimmerman from uh, uh, ICLE at COP23, please. ICLE, Local Governments for Sustainability. Yeah, local and regional governments are actually key actors in the field of climate change. This is valid for mitigating greenhouse gas emissions equally then to adaptation. I think we are going to speak about that. Cities feel very early the impacts of climate change. They do feel it already today. So cities have been eager and active in mitigating greenhouse gas emissions for many, many years. And we have more than 20 years, 25 years ago, we have started to guide cities on how to make inventories on where they use energy and where they have all their greenhouse gas emissions. We help them to set up local climate action plans. We help them to implement these plans and we help them to report about the achievements. Now from that work we know since very long that mobility, urban mobility, is a key sector of where greenhouse gas emissions are coming from and actually we are very worried because this is increasing even in very ambitious cities, which do quite well in mitigating their greenhouse gas yeah. emissions. So before you go into eco-mobility though, I really want to give yeah. a little bit more background on ICLE because you're an important organization and network that's been around this space for a very long time. So to, before we go to eco-mobility, yeah. how long have you been at the COP and how big are you? I think, I think we are basically the biggest <laughs> network of local and regional governments which are specifically committed to sustainable development and we have been founded uh, more than 25 years ago. So since these UN climate conferences exist, this is since 95, we have been to each of these in order to organize and to raise the voice of the local and regional level 
in the negotiations, they are called the so-called sub-national level. And yeah. we are here to tell the nations which are sitting there and negotiate that they will never reach their greenhouse gas reduction targets if they not substantively include the local and the regional level into their strategy making, into their implementation. And we are here to offer our support, actually. So on Sunday, we have organized the climate summit of local and regional governments and their leaders. We had more than 300 mayors and governors and deputy mayors and so on here with more than 1,000 uh, participants, which all very clearly confirmed their commitment to be more ambitious than before even, to help others, to, to involve many more, to interact with a lot of other stakeholders and basically to interact with their citizens because this is one reason why this level is so relevant. They are closest to the people. Excellent, yeah, and so you, you have um, a very clear vision of, I mean, you've been in this space for a very long time, you have a very broad network, very active, um, and you have a very clear vision of the, of the possibility of the future. So I think you mentioned before about two initiatives in particular around eco-mobility, and I'm going to slaughter the word Kaohsiung. Okay, uh, A strategy, can you maybe yeah. spell that out a bit more? So, of course, we believe that sustainable urban mobility is the way to go, and that this yeah. is a very, very relevant a component, if not one of the key components for the transition and the transformation which we need in our urban areas. We have coined the term eco-mobility and this does express that we advise our cities to give a priority, a clear political priority to walking, cycling, wheeling, public transportation, small vehicles. We advocate for the right size vehicles, not for the big size vehicles, for the right size vehicles, but particularly to connect all that. Seamless connectivity is the term we use. So all that must be integrated, must fit to each other. Integrated means that you can change easily from bike to tram and from bus to walking, that you have um, ticketing systems which allow you to do so easily. But integrating can also mean that a city works or a, 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 a town works with its hinterland or with its surroundings, with, with its the uh, environment. Approach and a holistic right, because, approach. Because, I mean, yeah. the, the yeah, transportation absolutely. doesn't yeah. stop at your city yeah, borders. Absolutely. So this is the term which we have brought to the, to yeah. the debate. And under yeah. this term, we are now organizing a group of lead cities, our Ecomobility Alliance. We organize the so-called Ecomobility World Festivals. This is a one month activity where a city, which is very ambitious, says in one neighborhood we are going eco-mobile, which means we are trying to get as many cars out of that area as possible and we let the people enjoy for one month a lifestyle which is not dependent on the private car, but which can utilize all other types of what we now call eco-mobility. And this has just recently happened in the city of Kaohsiung in Chinese Taipei. We were very happy that we could see there how successful one can be to transform a neighborhood. That's we have also been challenged to see how difficult it is to talk to your citizens yeah. and to make them enjoy yeah. that lifestyle. That's fantastic. Thank you. I'm going to have to stop you. Then. And that's fantastic. And that's, you know, change is challenging and that's also why you need private sector on board. You need all the stakeholders on board to, to um, basically um, not only agree with the objective, but be willing to put in the willpower and to, to make those sorts of adaptations. Right. So the main principle, changes. maybe, if I can yeah. say that from the yeah. Kaohsiung strategies is give priority to people and not to vehicles when you plan your city. Yeah. That sounds yeah. so basic, but it means a lot. You're not the first to have said that, and I think no. it's a really good tenant it for has all to of be this mobile. It does, it has to be repeated. Thank you mm. so much. And um, we'll come back with the, with the final question. So Sebastian, thank you so much for joining us as well. Um, and you're coming from a little bit different lens, which we've pledged to make sure we're focusing on here as well, which is adaptation. This is a climate conference, and the, the parties to the, con to the UNFCCC constantly, and all of us try to prioritize an equal weight and balance adaptation and mitigation. So um, really glad you're here tonight you. um, from the center. And maybe you can explain a little bit about what that is, the center. Yeah, so uh, today we launched the Global Center of Excellence on Climate Adaptation. So fortunately, the Paris Agreement put uh, climate adaptation on par with mitigation. So how do we become less vulnerable? The climate is changing. We have climate risk. What to do about this and how to do this effectively? So it's such it's much newer field than mitigation, reducing CO2 emissions. So we constantly get this question of um, 
what is effective adaptation, how can we accelerate adaptation efforts. And that's why this center was created and launched today. Yeah, that's great. And so, um, and it, super important issue, what makes it especially unique? What are, what is the services sort of that you're providing? Yeah, very unique about this center is that it really brings all stakeholder groups together. So it's not a, it's more of a, it's not, it has a knowledge base of so excellence, but it's not a research endeavor. It's government, businesses, NGOs, ECLA is one of our partners, so city. So it's a really broad range of domains and stakeholders that really work together and discuss these um, pressing issues to actually accelerate um, effective adaptation. That's fantastic. And so I think you were mentioning that, that you're working on um, deepening the understanding, uh, yeah. sort of providing maybe um, some, some extra knowledge products or getting yeah. the, what, what yeah, is so sort of? What are the There's much work out there, so the, uh, the climate adaptation landscape is filled with really good work and good initiatives, so we want to build up on this. We want to recognize excellence, build excellence, and promote excellence. So as an example from the transport sector, which is one of our pillars, so thank you, uh, particularly Slowcat, who is uh, running that part for us. Um, they say, okay, if there's an example, Railroads, how do we keep our railways working effectively in extreme weather events? Trains get late, people don't like that. Why don't we adjust our timetables and inform people being on the train what, what time they will actually arrive? So they get a new timetable which is adjusted to extreme weather. That's a, a very simple example from the transport sector of how you can adapt. And it's something, it's a lesson, this is from the United Kingdom, it's brought to us from the Sustainable Rail uh, Association. And we can bring that to other countries. That's a great example. And or, yeah, or, did you have another one? Yeah, but also, <laughs> I mean, we have several, so it's, it, now this is a transport thing, but the same holds true for meteorological information. The World Meteorological Organization works with us and we provide meteorological information to farmers in Africa by SMS service, geo-based, so we know where they are, and they get an SMS what, how the weather will be like, so they can change what crops to buy, what to plant, and when to harvest. Right. And it's a climate service, it's sim simply something that's done in several places in pilots, we have to spread this knowledge around. There's, yes, there's a lot of really good um, initiatives and practices that are, that are brewing in multiple places, and now one of the challenges is to find out which, are the, which can be replicated and shared yeah. and, and, uh, and fostered in other places. So your center is really dedicated to yeah. that. So there's, that's yeah. exactly the, the product in principle. We convene you. Huh? So we invite you uh, to our events. To, we provide discussion briefs for all stakeholder groups to work with us to discuss what are the key issues. And we come up with a knowledge agenda and then can commission research, feed into capacity building programs, technical systems. We don't do that ourselves. Yeah. But we are kind of this place, this hub for of convener. Uh, for convener, excellent. And so, um, thank you so much, and uh, for for your work. And we're going to ask about your transport views on what is successful uh, uh, solutions for transport in one second. If you have any questions, you can bring them in to, uh, to hashtag We Are Transport. Um, so, so I, it's funny because. Uh, I always compa compared the climate change negotiations to an invention in a garage. Everyone was aiming for to invent like the killer invention in the garage, but simultaneously what happened was all these offshoots of inventions happened. They're like, well, I was aiming to, you know, create this machine, but the mistakes or the offshoots or the, oh, while I was doing that, I needed to invent a tool to invent this. And that's all of these amazing initiatives that basically have simultaneously um, led to fantastic work. So the climate change negotiations were the main engine in this garage that hopefully, you know, we got the Paris Agreement, et cetera, but simultaneously in that invention process, all of these other initiatives that are doing amazing work um, have, been, have been created in the process, the invention process. Um, so, Tanya, yeah. if you had <laughs> one, <laughs> one pragmatic solution for the, the transportation space that could um, happen right now. Okay, so I feel there only must be good examples, and the public sector normally is not always the best example, but if every public sector in the world, every ministry, ad every administration would equip uh, e-charging infrastructure on their sites and to look into their procurement processes, so is sustainability, sustainable transport and logistic under consideration in their co procurement systems and their procedures, I would say this is quite a large signal to everybody that we want to be a front runner in the public sector 
to transform the mobility we are using and the mobility of the goods which we are, which we are getting and working with. Excellent. That would, that would transform. Stephanie, one thing that could transform the transport sector. I would say that um, we should focus very much on making public transport the most convenient mode in a city. Not only by looking at the public transport sector per se, but also looking at discouraging car use by, for example, um, high parking fees or concession charging um, or any other tools um, to do that. And I think once that is done, and I strongly believe that convenience is the key factor why people would still opt for the private car, um, people would then start uh, shifting towards um, the public transport means if they're modern, if they are efficient, if they are faster, then um, the private means of motorization. So make public transport as convenient as possible. Yes. Okay. Annika. I joined Stephanie in saying that the car is a big problem. I would even reinforce that and would say the private cars are the biggest problems for the cities. Okay, I've got to reposition my question. This is the question. What is one pragmatic no, so I come to that. solution well, to transform the transport sector right now? So I wanted to, <laughs> to compliment that and say we need inner city areas which are car free and they must step by step increase. We need that at least 50% of the investments in transportation are for the non-motorized transport and the public transport. Excellent. Yes. Sebastian. Thank you. So every day we build roads, we maintain our railways, we renovate our ports and our airports. We spend trillions of dollars on transport infrastructure. Climate proof it. Every day is an opportunity, every time we spend money is an opportunity to climate prove it, to make it less vulnerable to the future. Both the infrastructure asset itself, so asset management, investment planning, climate proof it, get less vulnerable, and there's actually business in it. Couldn't agree more with that, good point. Um, did anybody, before we go to a question from the audience, did anybody want to comment on each other's work? It's so interrelated, you probably all have been working together in the wings or your organizations forever, but any comments on each other's work? very interested in the new initiative from our Dutch colleagues and <laughs> I would like to take, <laughs> take you, grab you and <laughs> to learn more about yeah. that this evening. Excellent. In all, in all honesty, so we talked to multiple countries, we were told Germany is a leader, but they're so busy organizing the COP, they, <laughs> <are vested. laughs> <laughs> they invest so much money and so much effort, talk to them in 2018. <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> good, we've got some good well. colla collaboration going, excellent. Okay, one more comment before we go to questions? From a local government side, I can say we are a leader. We are working on what we call resilient cities for, for the last 10 or more years. And we do have an annual big global congress here in Bonn on resilient cities. And the German government is supporting that. Excellent, excellent, yeah. good. Um, yeah, th there's, yeah, lots could be said there. So we did have one great question from the Twitter sphere that says, which cities slash countries are the most positive examples that others can learn from for decision makers to decarbonize transport? So which cities or countries are the most positive examples that others can learn from? Oh, um, Mon Monica can <laughs> answer this. We are asked this question very often. If you look into the real figures, the so-called modal split, so which type of mobility is used most, then I think some Scandinavian cities are really leading. First of all, Copenhagen, which has increased the non-motorized transport in enormously and has an extremely high share of bikes now. The second city I really want to name is Oslo, which is going to extend a huge inner city car-free area by 20, 2019. But we should rather give justice to the cities in developing countries or cities in countries which have it much more difficult, and I would include even here cities in the US. So for example, Boulder in the USA or Portland have done a great job. <laughs> Their figures are not as, as strong as those in Europe, but they are doing a great job to bring the people out of their cars into public transport. And many cities in the Global South try at least hard. Addis Abeba was mentioned with a, with a tram and a metro system. Uh, many cities in Asia, look at the many cities in China, for example, which are now establishing bike sharing systems. These are great examples. That's, yeah, that's and 
to look into the developing countries, I feel we must be honest, the bus rapid transit system was invented in Brazil. And if we look at the city of La Paz, for example, they just started a totally different system in the air. So there are many innovations and bold mayors in, the, the, in our partner countries would just take the things and they try it. And there's a lot of innovation, yeah. Absolutely, we just had, um, I think it was here, the, the, the representative from Quito was talking about the, the trams, et cetera, to address their, I don't know where, if I, ha I was interviewing or somebody else was. Yeah, the cable car, the cable in, in, La, in La Paz you have a to <laughs> an underground in the air, so exactly. it's a totally system about yeah. that, yeah, and it's you amazing. Think of the multiple cities that could be utilizing yeah. that to so, get to remote so the informal best, settlements. The best city is always, the city who combines yeah, all these absolutely. puzzle pieces yeah. and finds its own solutions for the for the accommodation. Yes. Mm -hmm. Did you want to add a final comment yes. before we close up? Yes, just to add on that, oh. um, looking, as, looking at best uh, practices is important to understand what works and what doesn't work. And what is uh, mutually important is to facilitate exchange from cities to cities. For example, in uh, Dar es Salaam just introduced a bus rapid transit system, which is very inspiring to the other East African cities. Um, that are in the process of developing their own mass rapid transit system. So what, what all of us should be also um, supporting um, as the development partners is those exchange visits and um, yeah, city Absolutely. to city twinnings Absolutely. that Absolutely. encourage that more. Absolutely. I'm um, hearing there's a question from the audience that we will accept now. I think we'll just take a break. Yeah, do you have a question? Hello, I'm Natalie from Cycling Without Age and I have a question to um, the representative from UN Habitat. Um, you've been talking about the new urban ad agenda and uh, your philosophy of um, universal, accessible um, urban mobility plan and I'm wondering how much do you, uh, in, in which way do you include in your um, discussions and your agenda people who are not mobile anymore, people who are 80 years old and they can't cycle by themselves, they have difficulties to take public transport, etc. Yes. The urban agenda has as one of its goals to be inclusive of everyone and we're talking about accessibility for all. So these kind of um, mobility constraint groups of the society are very much um, considered in those discussions. And especially um, in regard to that, it is very important to involve also the civil society groups um, as stakeholders in the discussions. And that's one of the, um, I would say, one, one of the key features of the Habitat 3 agenda, which was really a multi-stakeholder um, dialogue and a multi-stakeholder fora where exactly um, yeah, the in inc inclusiveness um, feature was uh, looked upon and f focused on very much. Great, and I think Monica, you wanted yeah, to add I something? I want to add that the big task of local governments is to reorganize and reconsider their public space and their space for mobility. And not only that the car-centered part of that space must be reduced, but we also have to think about the different speeds and the different modalities of transport of different groups of society. So already today a bike lane doesn't fit for a normal bike and an e-bike because the e-bike is so much faster. So what we want is that the space is reconsidered, reshared in new, completely new models and that the most vulnerable groups are, are very strongly represented in these thoughts because it cannot be that we have all types of vehicles on our streets and we will have much more small, light e-vehicles, for example, but that it's not clear where they can go and that they would just disturb the, the people who walk, for example. Did you, did you want to add anything? No, well, only as a citizen. I cycle my children to school and to work and I'm Dutch myself in the Netherlands, that would be fine. I don't live in the Netherlands anymore. And it's, it's very dangerous. And I would love to give my children a culture of, of cycling to school. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, I really applaud what you are doing, but as a citizen. Yeah. So yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and I think, you know, people with restricted mobility for, for, for various reasons are increasingly active in this space. And it's nice to see that they're, they're organized and that they have strong representation. I've seen, you know, them here and it's, it's, um, it's, it's very good. Um, and I think their concerns are being increasingly heard which, by, by various groups, which is, which is great. Um, 
Uh, okay, so one other question on, I think, from Twitter, by from Eduardo. How to plan the role of non-motorized modes in cities with slopes, hills, and inclement weather? I'm assuming it's inclement. He just said weather. But <laughs> so um, thoughts on how to plan the role of non-motorized modes in cities with slopes, hills, or weather. Any thoughts on that? There are plenty of good examples. This is done already good examples. today. Yes. For example, in this city of Kaohsiung, which I had mentioned, as in many cities in, uh, in East Asia, you have uh, areas where you have um, walkways for people which are covered from houses, let's say like that, arcades we would call it. Mm -hmm. So normally you could very well walk protected by sun and by rain. But what is currently happening, what you have are scooters and cars who park there. So you must get rid of them and you have wonderful walkways for people. We have um, cities which consider to cover bike uh, cycle walk, uh, ways with um, solar panels, so that would collect solar energy and would protect. Mm -hmm. We have cities which have uh, uh, um, elevators to, to, uh, to help people to overcome barriers in, in terms of altitude. So there's plenty yeah. of examples. There's escalators, there's Escalate. cable cars, there's electric bikes actually for, um, to encourage bike use in areas where there's greater slopes, etc. cetera. Um, there's, there's a lot of good solutions. And there's even, under, even in the United States, there's underground tunnels in some areas of like, you know, small, like Wisconsin, I think, has these as well. So there's innovate, th those have been around forever. So there's some really good ideas. I think that the point is, those are good funding, good design, urban planning, interconnection between all these different um, ministries and cabinets and planning units. We have to wrap up tonight. Um, really good questions. And I think, you know, it's, it's like you said, you can't hear enough about the, the same things about it's people-centered, it's interconnected, it's about using modern technology as well as old ideas that just make sense. Um, so we're hearing the same messages, but uh, it's really great that from so many different people and uh, Clearly, you guys will be <laughs> connecting after this, and greater things will happen. <laughs> so that's what's so great about these things. Um, so from the transport talk shows here at COP23 at the DHL headquarters, thanks for DHL. Thanks, PPMC. If you're interested in sending in questions for the next two shows, we only have two left, one on commitments and progress, and one's on the future of transport with wonderful guests as well. Send in your questions to hashtag WeAreTransport. Thanks for our wonderful guests. Thanks for our audience. Thanks for my wonderful team. You know who you are. I've been meaning to thank all of you, but I won't bore everybody else. Um, but thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you for your job.